Hello, my dear friends. Uh, welcome to Sairam Academy. This is a continuation of uh, our motor program theory uh, classes. Uh, my apologies for uh, the long delay in my second video because of some personal commitments I'm not able to do. But uh, from here on, I promise that it is going to be regular. Having seen two very important theories, the reflex theory and the hierarchical theory in my previous class, we are moving on to a theory called motor program theory. So this theory is a very important theory which clearly explained that the brain is not a reactive machine. It is an action machine. Why I say reactive means the previous two theories, the reflex and the hierarchical theory stated that the sensory input that is given to the central nervous system that causes the motor output. So the sensory input was very widely discussed uh, in those theories. But here, this theory stated that the central nervous system is capable of producing movements without sensory inputs. This theory was evolved around 1960s, uh, uh, from 1950 to 1970, around 1960. This included uh, the psychologist and biologist apart from neuroclinicians. So that is the significance of this particular uh, model. Because when always biological professionals comes into uh, the scene, they always experiment with animals. So this theory was based upon a lot of experiments. These experiments were done on many primate animals and uh, vertebrates which are like animals like a cat and locust. So there were the experiments uh, done on a grasshopper or a locust. Uh, so you may be very familiar with this locust right now because um, that is creeping around our uh, North India. So if you see this uh, locust, how it flies, it has two types of wings, one for propelling, another one for floating. And uh, the front one is propelling and giving direction and they moves in the same pattern, in a similar pattern. Okay, you might have seen how an eagle flies. It flaps for uh, 15, 20 times and then it keeps its uh, wings safe and then it just floats. And then again it flaps. So those repetitions are produced by the brain and which is not explained. It is, it, it is not dependent on any sensory inputs. So this theory explained that there are set of movements that happen sequentially, cyclically, which are in a same pattern. And that is called as central pattern generators. The same concept was also seen in cat. When a cat was experimented uh, with its sensory system getting cut off from its brain, and still it was able to walk. And that was a fascinating thing which proved that sensory inputs are not always necessary for the movements to happen. And in these same cats, the discharge from the brain to the spinal cord was also cut. And then uh, when it was experimented, it showed that same movement existed in this cat. So that again said that the brain also do not have an influence on these movements. And then, then where from these movements are taking place, that is a big question. So these movements are taking place by a mechanism called as a central pattern generators, which are nothing but a spinally mediated motor program. Okay, so uh, when we see central pattern generators, a classical example we would like to explain in human behavior is walking. How we do walking? Once it is mastered after one and one year and two years, we just like that walk. We don't think about anything when we are walking. When we wanted to explore the world, we start walking. We don't sequentially plan how to keep our feet and walk on a level ground. So this is a cyclic event where your hip moves, your knee moves, your ankle moves in a sequential pattern that keeps on repeating uh, time and again. So this pattern of movement is registered in the human body, where particularly in the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is capable of producing these movements. It is not only true for walking, it is also true for chewing, swallowing, and standing. In standing, it's all static, but in walking, it's all dynamic. That is the only difference. And the blueprint of walking is same for the blueprint of running. So when you are walking is going to convert into running, only thing that changes is the time component. 
the uh, duration for which you are going to stance with both legs, that is uh, bilateral stance phase, that is going to come down. And bilateral swing phase is going to increase. Your legs are mostly going to be on the air when you are, and the velocity of the uh, propulsion is going to increase. So this is a somewhat pre-programmed activity, okay, which happens whenever there is a requirement. So how it is influenced by sensation was not clearly explained. But now we can say when a horse is running, when the person is beating the horse, the horse is going to run fast. The sensory system is going to increase the, uh, the uh, horse running. But again, that is, uh, that is not more than uh, a conditional learning. Like when you beat, it has to run fast. That is, uh, that is a sensory input. But apart from that, the system did not uh, um, explain anything much about the sensation influence on movement. Okay, this theory which uh, clearly stated one particular thing that the summative sensory inputs are not important for movements. Once again, why? The vision has the ability to compensate for the summative sensory inputs. The tactile sensations are not always needed for uh, quality movement to be produced. For example, a patient with a spinal cord injury, higher spinal cord injury, who has a complete uh, sensory loss in the lower uh, of the body can still try to sit if there is no sensation. Even if the motor system is persistent, uh, he'll be able to sit uh, because he knows how he was sitting before and he can uh, uh, rehearsal that uh, activity and also his vision is there whether he's going into the verticality or he is in the horizontal plane and he can cross check with his visual system and he can very well sit. But what is the disadvantage of uh, this particular thing is uh, all these experiments were done on uh, quadrupedal animals which are way far different from a human being who are bipedal. So what is the main difference between the spinal cord uh, organization in these uh, quadrupedal animals is, the spinal cord is much more uh, developed and integrated in case of uh, the quadrupedal animals compared to bipedal animals like human beings. So. Uh, when I wanted to look into these central pattern generators, I came to know that people who are training horses read more about these central pattern generators than we do. Basically because in horse, most of them, they are uh, related to racing, right? As far as racing is concerned, there is going to be a lane. This horse is going to run on the lane, irrespective of whatever the uh, constraints are. It has to finish the uh, a lap within a given time as early as possible. So that is the only target. So here the central pattern generator, generators are so vital that if it is very strong and if it is uh, happening very fast, then the, the horse is going to be very successful. So uh, they are studying the central pattern generators more compared to a physiotherapist. So what they have come out with the truth is for a quadrupedal animal, uh, it is more or less like a car how a car is run, the front wheels are very important. They give the direction, they uh, give the acceleration for the hind wheels. The hind wheels are going to be simply passive. So the same thing is true in case of a horse. The front leg is the one which gallops, which increases the speed, and the, the hind leg is going to just follow that. The directional change is also going to be given by the front legs. So that's why if you see when the horse is getting into a water, when it is finding it very difficult, all these primates climbs with its front limb. Okay, it never climbs with its hind limb. Even if the situation is such that it turns its body and it can climb only with the front limb. So that is how the central pattern generators are predominantly loaded in the upper limb. So when a study was done where the horse got spinal cord injury and it got paralyzed, it was still able to walk provided if its body weight was supported by some external uh, substance uh, or, or hoist or something like that. Because the central pattern generators were active for them in the uh, front, for the front limb. So 
they were able to do that. But the same thing, uh, if you see in a human being, when you uh, lift the body weight of the patient in case of a spinal cord injury patient, he cannot walk because his central pattern generators are entirely different. They are not that much empowered uh, in case of uh, uh, how it is in case of a quadrupedal animal. So there is a lot of difference between animal and human being. So the system, the hypothesis, what are all drawn from these animals failed miserably in human being. So uh, if you see Shambhai Cook, um, the motor control uh, theory from where I have read a lot of motor control theories, uh, they gave me, uh, they've, they've given a, a, a task where you have to do a signature in a small piece of paper and also on a blackboard. When you're doing on a blackboard, you have to do it with your dominant hand as well as with your non-dominant hand. If you observe all the three signatures, you will come to a conclusion that all these three signatures were, done in, were did in different context, were did with different muscles of the body moving uh, uh, the limb, but yet the characters are similar. So the characters like the A, the R, the run of the, the length of the um, signature, the pattern of the signature, everything is similar. So I have signed uh, on a board with a dominant hand and non-dominant non hand. I saw the same thing because the, uh, the shape differs, but the pattern remains the same. So the pattern is being generated by the spinal cord and the execution is done by the muscles, which are different. So because of the execution problem, the, uh, there is a lot of difference here, but the pattern is same. So that is what. And I did an experiment with my son who is 11 year old to know whether the central pattern generators uh, do have any age for development. And when I asked him to sign with his dominant and non-dominant hand, this was after a lot of effort he took to make it so similar, but he failed uh, very badly compared to me uh, because uh, I, I perceive that because I have been using a signature nearly for 20 years to sign. I frequently use it. So a fair amount of learning that goes into my brain. So even if I write with the right hand, I'm able to somewhat mimic my, uh, uh, even if I write with my left hand, I'm able to mimic my right hand. But whereas my son has not signed so far very frequently, so he's not able to mimic his uh, right hand side. And maybe I can attribute this, this to the practice um, the cognitive practice, maybe. I have not practiced with my left hand, but still I'm able to do, but he is not able to do because his cognitive practice of the signature has not happened. So I will also leave this uh, decision making to the uh, viewers. Uh, you can also explain me why this happens differently in adult and uh, uh, kid, like 11 or 10 year old kid. So what are the limitations of uh, motor programs theory? Very important limitation of this theory is it did not give any consideration to the sensory system as such. It explained how movement takes place, how movement takes place independent of the brain input, independent of the sensory input, how the movement was so sequential and pattern, and it was very pendular uh, oscillatory movement pattern that is uh, here a muscle activates, then it relaxes, this activates, and then it relaxes, it activates. So there's a pendular pattern, all these explain, but what is the real role of the sensory system in such movement production is not explained absolutely. So uh, what happened invariably because of this, invariably because of this, a very important system uh, was not considered for movement generation. Uh, in the present day scenario, sensory system is also given consideration in retraining a person. But why this might have happened? Maybe because uh, this theory contradicted a theory which heavily relied on sensory inputs for motor output. So they wanted to contradict them. So they didn't give a small consideration also about their predecessor's concept. So one thing or they may have thought that a lot of things were discussed about sensory system in the previous theories and we should not concentrate more on sensory systems. So they concentrated on the central pattern generators predominantly. So the next uh, very important uh, problem with this theory is um, it did not explain how the central pattern uh, generators could produce movements from different body postures. 
when the gravity is in influence uh, the body, when the gravity is not influencing the body, the muscle activation differs. How the central pattern generators differ for the same command. For example, if I want to eat, okay, if I want to eat a biscuit, this is a normal pattern when my hand is along with my body. If my hand is on a table or something like that here, if I want to reach out for the biscuit like this and I have to eat, so here, my shoulder muscles also have to work apart from my elbow and the forearm muscles. So here the pattern differs. So this theory was not able to explain how in different body posture, in different task uh, contest, the patterns differed. Next, very important thing, the environmental contest. A same command in two different environmental contexts differed. Uh, a classical example I would like to tell you, when you're walking on a level ground, when you see there is no hazard around you, you walk very freely, you used to dual task, you used to uh, talk to somebody and you don't know that you're walking but still you keep walking and you, you concentrate on something else. But whereas when you're walking on a height, when you are concentrating on um, walking on a surface which you perceive that it is risky, but in actual, there is no risk. Your mind also knows that. You see some people walking in front of you. In spite of that, that fear makes you walk with a different walking pattern. You tend to lower the center of gravity. You tend to grab onto uh, nearby objects. So these are all the environmental context that makes you do, uh, walk in a different way. This is uh, true in case of uh, other tasks also. So this theory was not able to explain this particular phenomenon of human being. And very importantly, this theory considered only the nervous system. Um, it did not consider the musculoskeletal or the respiratory system into consideration. Because when you are doing any exercise uh, in the initial phase, when you are able to lift the weight, your movement will be very symmetrical, very patterned, everything is fine. After doing 10 to 15 repetitions, how your movement becomes, you tend to, you, if your muscle becomes fatigued, you tend to contract all other accessory muscles and your pattern of movement entirely differs. Your trunk comes into roll, your, you start making uh, faces, you frown, all these things are going to happen. So this theory was not able to explain why during fatigue these accessory movements took place. And it did not explain this phenomenon. That's very uh, significant. So this theory failed because of all these uh, factors but you cannot say you cannot rule out a motor programs theory when you are dealing with a stroke patient because it came out with a very strong information this information i'm splitting into three things for your comprehension and for your better understanding so the first uh, line i would like to uh, extract is the intervention should focus on retraining movement so this is when our physiotherapist started deviating from concentrating only on reflex, only on giving sensory inputs to bring about motor outputs. They came to know that sensory uh, input is not at all needed because all animals are able to do uh, movements without sensory inputs. So that's when they started knowing that there is a pattern and if this pattern is lost, you have to make the system relearn the pattern. So that is very important. Intervention should focus on retraining the movement for pattern, which is lost. Second very important rule is the uh, functional task has to be emphasized. Okay, so uh, uh, any movement you are training, uh, that should be a functional movement rather than an isolated movement, which, uh, which is not of any purpose. Okay, so not just re-educating specific muscle in isolation, it is about retraining the function as whole. Well. So if you read this sentence together, the intervention should focus on retraining movement which are important to functional tasks, not just re-educating specific muscles in isolation. So if you remember these three rules, uh, which are emphasized even uh, in the current day scenario, you will know how important the motor programs theory is for uh, a revolution in the uh, management of the high upper motor neuron lesion patients. So uh, with this, I conclude. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward for the future uh, 
um, uh, theories. You can send in your queries to Sairam Academy uh, uh, email ID or you can write in our uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the first time I'm asking you guys, uh, please subscribe to us and click the bell button. After all these views and the subscription also encourages teachers like us. Thank you so much. Looking forward for some more videos.